Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about your brick wall ancestors. Lots of reasons why you might not be finding your ancestors. Um, we call them a brick wall in genealogy, which means you've researched and looked and tried to figure it out and you just can't. And sometimes those brick walls are pretty solid, but sometimes those brick walls aren't quite as thick as we think they are. And in fact, sometimes we create them ourselves um, because of our own newness to the hobby or lack of information or whatever reason. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just means that it's time for a little more education. So I'm glad you're here. We're gonna talk specifically today about five reasons why you might not be finding your specific brick wall ancestor that you're looking for. And then I'll share with you some things you can do to overcome some of those reasons. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, we're going to just get started right away with reason number one that you might not be finding your ancestor is because you're putting too much emphasis on family stories and information. Now, of course, um, there, there is a proper way to do this, right? We always tell people who are just getting started in family history, talk to your family, uh, talk to that oldest living family member, uh, you know, talk to your brothers and sisters, ask them what they remember about your parents and your grandparents and birth dates and marriage dates and where people lived and uh, you know what the family story is about who immigrated when and where. Collect all of that information. Um, make sure you record it. Write it down somewhere. Uh, write down the information they provide. One of the things you're going to discover is as you talk to different members of your family, they're not all going to have the same exact story. And even if they do, that doesn't necessarily mean that the story is true. And so we encourage you to talk to them. We encourage you to find out what they know, but then look for records that will prove or disprove the information that they have shared with you. So for example, if they say, um, I was just helping a woman uh, this morning who um, she'd been told her whole life that her family was Lithuanian, that they had immigrated from Lithuania in the early 1900s and that they were Lithuanian. She even recounted a story to me about how back in the late 1980s, uh, there was a Lithuanian Heritage Day celebration and she went to that in, her, in the town she was in and, and um, she said it was really odd, like she just, Nothing was familiar to her, and she thought for sure she would show up at this Lithuanian celebration and something would be familiar or feel familiar, the food or the language or the customs or the dances or something. Nothing did. Well, uh, in just a few minutes with her, um, uh, we went looking for that record um, to prove or disprove the information that had been shared with her by her family members. And we were able to find her grandparents and her father's older siblings on a passenger list coming into Ellis Island in 1904. They sailed out of Bremen, Germany. Their last known residence was Lithuania, but they spoke German. And as she recounted additional information to me, they actually were uh, Lutheran uh, rather than Catholic. And so they had lived, in, like the story was true, right? They had lived in Lithuania and based on what we know a little bit about history and the German settlements um, in Russia, in various parts of Russia, um, it's very likely that her family had been living in Lithuania for a few generations, but they were Germans living there. Um, so they maintained their language and they maintained their religion. And so we were able to both prove and disprove information that had been shared with her. They were not Lithuanian, they were German, they had just been living in Lithuania. So sometimes the reason you're not finding your ancestor is because you're putting too much emphasis on those family stories about somebody being Native American or about somebody being related to Daniel Boone or about somebody whatever, right? So always go looking for records to prove or disprove the information that's shared. And then once you figure out the real story, write that down. Make sure that's what gets recorded in your online family tree. Maybe even do a little write-up about it in a Word document or a text file or write into the comments in the person or people on your tree that it pertains to so that that information then is recorded for future generations who might hear some of those same family stories. 
Another reason you might not be finding your ancestors is because you're using someone else's unsourced tree as the starting point for discovering more. Now, there's a couple of things I want to point out about this statement. First of all, um, this word unsourced. There are some amazing family trees out there. Many of you are, are so conscientious about making sure that every th single piece of information you enter into your family tree is, is sourced and fully documented and that you've um, you know, followed the genealogical proof standard and you, you've you know, done your reasonably exhaustive search, you have cited all of your sources, you have analyzed and correlated the information, you have um, resolved your conflicting evidence and now you've put this into your tree and your trees are um, both a work they're just a work of genealogical art <laughs> and so thank you for those of you who are conscientious about making sure that truth is out there and available to people in these well sourced well documented family trees people have been doing that in various shapes and forms for hundreds of years uh, now we have online trees but I inherited some books uh, from my family members when I was a teenager where people had again spent you know hundreds and thousands of hours of their lives and thousands of dollars tracking down all of the documentation they needed to prove that you know the parents of Matthew were this couple not this couple and they've got the information that they've published in this book and 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 that becomes the family tree so lots of ways that we have through time acquired family trees and just like, you know, 200 to 150 years ago, um, there were people who were publishing uh, fraudulent genealogies, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. We see the same thing uh, in, in online trees today. And so always pay attention to what the sources are. And not just that they are sourced, but that those sources make sense to you, that you can review the sources and determine if this is um, uh, somebody who's conscientious about their research or not. So instead of using someone else's unsourced tree as the starting point for discovering more, um, maybe look for records first. <coughs> Excuse me. If you know, for example, that you are looking for your great-grandfather's parents, rather than jumping directly into somebody else's tree and seeing what they have to say about it, maybe find your great-grandfather on a census record as a child, um, see if there is anybody else with his similar name and a similar birth date in place. So, you know, are you dealing with one William Woodruff living in Northwest Arkansas? Are you dealing with four of them? And maybe make sure that you um, know who the parents of each of those four William Woodruffs are so that you can start to figure out which set of parents um, are, are the, your Williams, right? So always look at records first, and I, I say that because what it means then is that you're looking at those records unbiased, okay? I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna look at somebody's tree and then I'm gonna go and try and prove that tree. And that's fine except <laughs> um, if they've, you know, like say they've said, um, Walter and Susan are the parents of William. And you go out and you say, okay, I'm gonna prove this. And sure enough, you find a William on a census record with a Walter and a Susan. But what's to say that that's your William, okay? What if there are three other Williams uh, that have three separate sets of parents. How did they come to the conclusion that that's the right one? Okay, so I always look at records first and encourage you to do the same thing so that you're looking at it with unbiased um, uh, eyes before you start looking at other people's trees. Now, when you do review online trees, and I use them, they are a source just like anything else, and um, I certainly don't want to be accused of source snobbery, as Dr. Thomas Jones puts it. Um, I do use online trees or other people's family histories or things that have been published in books, whether those books were published you know, 10 years ago or 150 years ago, but I always look to see what sources they use to come to their conclusions. Can I recreate that same conclusion using the information that they have provided? And if I can, then great. If I can't, then 
communicate with other tree owners. Be willing to just send a message and you can do that through Ancestry. Um, you just click on the name of the tree owner and there's an opportunity to contact them. And you can say, you know what? You are the only tree I have found that lists the parents of my great, great, great grandparents. Cannot find them anywhere else. I've looked in all the records. I've checked um, everywhere I can think to check and you have these people listed as his parents. Could you please tell me where you got this information? I would love to know that, okay? And, and you know, maybe even in the process now, I've discovered a new cousin. And, and then, you know, thank them for their time. So communicate with each other. Be willing to collaborate and reach out and ask people where they got their information. Um, my tree, just as, uh, just as an example, my tree is very, very pretty well documented, um, but I started doing this years ago when all of my documentation was done in my notes. Some of you have seen the way in which I do that, um, and uh, I create my source citations uh, in, in a separate thing, and so it wasn't until I got my tree online at Ancestry and started attaching records that people can actually see my sources, because notes are private. So even though my tree is public, my notes are private. So if somebody contacts me, even though it might look like I have no sources attached to my tree um, or to a particular person in my tree, uh, if they contact me, I will gladly share the contents of my notes, uh, my research notes for that particular person or that family. And those are usually pretty extensive. So be willing to reach out and communicate with each other. Let's talk about another reason why you might not be finding your ancestors. Uh, it could be because you are searching for records that don't exist, or maybe it is that they don't exist in the place that you're looking. Um, I had my mom for a high school class when I was growing up. She's a brilliant teacher. Um, and. Uh, she told a story that has stuck with me forever, and I've since heard it uh, retold in a couple different variations. Clearly, it's it's a it's a story. It is not a true true story. <laughs> um, it's a parable, if you will, uh, to teach a point. But it has it has really stuck with me. So the story is told um, about a man who is out on a street corner under a street lamp in the middle of the night, down on his hands and his knees, and he's clearly looking for something, clearly searching for something. And a policeman comes upon him and he says, sir, you know, can I help you? What are you doing? And he says, I lost my car keys. And so I'm looking for my car keys. And, and so of course the officer says, oh, well, please let me help. And he gets down on his hands and knees and they're searching and searching and searching on this street corner under this street lamp for these car keys and after uh, several minutes of searching and not having any luck the police officer says to the man are you sure this is where you lost them and the guy said oh no no I lost them down the street but the light is better here <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> Sometimes we approach our research that same way. You know, we take the obvious route or the easiest route rather than the most likely route to find the records that we're looking for. So just because it's easy to type a name into a search engine doesn't mean that's where you're going to find the records that you're looking for. So you need to know, right, what records exist and where those records are going to be found. I cannot praise the card catalog enough. Um, it is my most favorite feature on Ancestry.com. The card catalog allows you to very quickly determine before you ever conduct a single search, it allows you to determine what records are available online at Ancestry. If you're not familiar with the card catalog, I have done an entire video on it, but I will just do a quick preview here for those of you who are brand new with us. The card catalog is the bottom option on the search menu. So you have your search, you just come down here and click on the card catalog. This allows you to see all 32,416 databases on Ancestry.com in which there are 15 billion records. Okay, You can then filter it by any number of ways. You can filter it by kind of record, by location, by time period. Or you could just come in here and type in the name of a particular location. So for example, I type in Alabama, I click search. That's going to show me the 181 databases on Ancestry.com that have Alabama specific records. 
Maybe I'm looking for marriage records specifically, so I can narrow those down really quickly to marriage records, right? Um, and then I can see if there are specific databases of interest to me that I want, might want to uh, investigate further. Okay, so use the card catalog to determine what records are online. If I'm searching for an Alabama marriage record from 1986, which sounds silly, but I get emails from people every day saying, I came to your website and I did a search and I can't find myself, and so what good is this? Um, well, it's because different states have different privacy laws, and Ancestry has no control over that. We can only put online what the states are willing to share with us. And so this is a quick way to come in and see, you know, what time period is covered by the records um, in the online collection. Then, bef again, before you do a single search, I would encourage you to read the database descriptions where they exist. So below the search box, if you scroll down past the search box on every database, there is going to be a database description. This database description is going to give you information about what is and is not included in this particular database and where you can go. In many cases, these are just indexes to find the original record. <coughs> One of my favorite features in the database description, um, where it's available, <coughs> excuse me, where it's available, we have included a list of, in this case, counties and years of coverage. So for example, this particular database, let me make this a little bigger so you can see it. This particular database says Alabama marriages from 1800 to 1969. But if you scroll down here to this database description, you're going to see that Cherokee County records don't start until 1821. And it looks like, for whatever reason, courthouse fires, um, infestations, mold, misfilings, record loss, whatever happens to records over the course of 150, 175 years, things happen to records. And so here we have Cherokee County starts in 1821, but then it looks like the records for 1825 are missing. And the records for 1838, 39, and 40 are missing and 47 is missing, and 50 through 61 is missing, right? So we'll give you where we have access to this information, the coverage of those records. So if I'm looking for a Cherokee marriage record in 1873, I can come right here and see that record does not exist online, and chances are, looking at this, this um, collection and the way that it's organized, they may not exist at all, okay? Um, but I can look at this database description to figure out who to contact in order to see if they exist anywhere. Okay, so always check the card catalog to determine what's online. Read those database descriptions to see what's included in that particular database. And then when you're searching, you're, you make sure you're searching for records that actually exist in the place that you're looking for them. Okay, not just because the light is better there. Um, and then the last little um, note on that is sometimes you have to do a little more digging to see if the record exists at all anywhere. Um, sometimes, like I said, records have been destroyed or in some cases were never kept. Um, I know a lot of states here in the United States did not require um, mandatory registration of births, sometimes until the 1920s, 1930s. And so some counties kept birth records before that, but it was not mandatory that you register the birth of your child. And so even though it may say, oh, um, you know, we have birth records for this county for this particular time period, maybe the, the compliance to that request was only 20 or 30 percent of births. Uh, maybe not everybody complied with that request. And so that means you need to look other places for the information that you're looking for. So a little bit of research is sometimes required before you can search in the records. Um, so talking about record searching, uh, this is our fourth, I think it's our fourth tip. Um, one of the reasons you might not be finding your ancestors is because you're stuck in a search rut. 
I love, one of the things I love is spending time with you. I go out to conferences and events and I speak and um, have the opportunity to interact with some of you on social media. And I love the opportunity to do that because I learn so much from you. Um, I learn from you about things I didn't know about, but I also learn from you um, the ways in which you approach your work and that helps inform the way that I teach. And so I'm really grateful for that opportunity. And um, one of the things that I have discovered as I have spent time with so many of you is that very often, and this is human nature, we get stuck in a pattern of behavior. And so, for example, um, some of you, uh, the only thing you do is you come in here and you look at this hint number and you start clearing hints. Um, you know, like it's some kind of a race against the number. I think that, I just, I think it's funny. Um, because the thing is, is every time you add a new person to your tree, you're going to get more hints, right? You're never going to clear all your, <laughs> all your hints um, as long as you continue to grow your tree. But, um, but some of you, that's the way that you approach your research. And that's fine. We provide those hints so that you do have access to some of that low-hanging fruit that we can quickly provide you with. Some of you um, do your um, searching directly from your tree, and so you come in here to your tree and you pull up somebody in your tree and you click this search records button and you just start and, and you let the system fill out the search form for you with every single piece of information it knows about your particular um, relative or ancestor and, um, and that's how you do your searches. Some of you only view your search records, your search results by um, by record type. So you come in here and this is how you view your search result. There's my cute great grandpa. Um, <laughs> I knew him. That just I, That's just a fun picture to see. Um, anyway, you come in here and you see your search results like this and you go through them this way every time. Uh, some of you only view your search results by category, meaning you come in here and you, you think, oh, I'm looking for a 1920 census, I'm gonna go straight there, or I'm looking for a World War I draft card, so I'm gonna go straight to that database, whatever the circumstance might be. And that's fine, because it's working for you. But we're talking about times when it's not working, right? When you're looking for something and you're not finding it. So, <coughs> be aware that there are lots of different ways to search and try something different. Okay, don't keep trying the same thing over and over and expecting different results. <laughs> try something different. So you can initiate your search from your tree. I just showed you how to do that. You can also initiate a search from what we call our global search form. That just means you click on the search button and you fill in the fields rather than letting the tree fill in the fields. It makes a difference. Um, you can initiate your search from a category page, meaning one of these, you know, if you're looking for a census record or you're looking for an immigration record, click on that category because the search form is going to have different fields for you to fill in based on what, what is known about what you're searching for. <coughs> you can also search directly from a specific database. If I know I'm looking for a 1940 search rec or, uh, census record, I'm going to come directly to the 1940 database and use the search form on that page because Ancestry knows what fields we indexed in this particular record collection and we're going to provide you all of the fields indexed in that collection so that you can search them. So try searching from different places instead of always searching the same exact way every time. Also. Play around with your search parameters. Try searching with no name, or try searching with no locations, or try searching with no dates. Don't try searching without one of those three, <laughs> okay? Always make sure you have one of them, a name, a date, or a location. <coughs> but I have found, I am so sorry about this cough, but I have found that sometimes if I remove the name and just have in a date and a location, I sometimes find what I want in the very first time I do that particular search. And so be willing to play around with those search parameters. Sometimes less is more, uh, sometimes more is more. It just depends on the kind of record that you're looking for. And sometimes we forget that we're looking for records and we try to look for people and we think, oh, the more information I provide, the better. Well, 
that isn't always true. Sometimes there's very minimal information on a record. And so um, think about the kinds of records that you're going to be looking for as well. Okay, our last tip, <coughs> the last reason why, okay, there's lots of reasons why, but the last reason for today's purposes, why you're not finding your ancestor could be because you're not looking at your ancestor's entire life. Instead of looking at them as a whole person, you're looking at them as a name and a date and a place in your tree, um, you know, trying to fill in some blanks. And it's easy. It, it's an easy rut to fall into. It's an easy habit to develop. I'm looking for the parents and the parents and the parents, and I can't find my grandfather's parents. And we get stuck in that mindset. And sometimes we need to just step back a little bit and recognize that the, their lives were about a whole lot more than just their parents. Um, I imagine your life is as well. My life certainly is. Um, I love my parents. <laughs> as a matter of fact, um, I, you know, I, I love spending time with them even now. And I live with my sister and my brother lives a couple blocks from my office. And I have five nephews who just moved um, to a town, you know, the next town over uh, instead of living an hour away. And so they've become a part of almost of my daily life. And, you know, I have a, I have a grandmother, a 92-year-old grandmother who lives down in Los Angeles who I try to get down and see as often as I can. Um, and, uh, and a couple of aunts and some cousins who also live there. And so my life is about a whole lot more than just me and my parents. That's the point. And sometimes when we're doing genealogy, we forget that. And so instead of looking for your grandfather's parents and hitting that brick wall, right, what if you looked for his brothers and sisters and their children and grandchildren? Because you don't know who might have the information that you need to find your grandfather's parents. What if you, instead of <clears throat> trying to find the name of his parents, collected everybody that has the same last name living in the same little town in Ohio in the 1840 census and then look at their ages and see if you can determine who might be his brothers versus who might be possible candidates for his father versus who might be cousins, right? Start collecting um, people who live in the same area, <coughs> which means you need to know a little bit more about your grandfather sometimes. People come to me all the time asking for research assistance and they say, I'm, I'm looking for my grandfather's parents. Okay, well, what do you know about them? Nothing. Okay, well then let's step down a generation. What do you know about your grandfather? Well, I know everything about him. I'm looking for his parents, okay? Sometimes we have to step back a generation or down a generation and make sure we really do know everything about our grandfather before we can find his parents. Do you know everywhere he lived? Have you located him in every census? Have you tracked him through city directories and tax records and property records? Who are his neighbors? Have you jotted down those names in a notebook somewhere so that you are familiar with who his neighbors are? Because if he has neighbors in Pennsylvania and those same exact neighbors show up when he moves to Ohio, maybe those are family members. Maybe those are sisters who have married somebody with a different last name. <coughs> Maybe they're associates. Maybe they're family or people that he worships with or works with. Maybe they're people he immigrated from Ireland with. Right. Keep track of those names that keep showing up over and over in his life. Every piece of information you gather about your grandfather and his life not only is going to lead you closer to clues about who his parents might be, but it's also going to ensure that when you finally do discover his parents, you've chosen the correct parents and not some other William's parents so that you're climbing your own family tree. Well, that is all I have prepared for you today. Hopefully this was useful information. I've actually pre-recorded today's presentation. I am uh, on vacation in the mountains of West Virginia uh, during the time that this video is scheduled to be aired. So I will not be on chat immediately following the presentation, but some uh, other members of our social media team will be. So please um, feel free to chat amongst yourselves and ask them any questions. Uh, this video will also be uploaded to YouTube. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them uh, below the video here. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.